So thanks for the introduction, Ron. Uh, a couple of things about my time with Ron. So I was here as a doctoral student about 20 years ago. And there were some fundamental frameworks and lessons that I learned from Ron that have been influential in how I practice venture capital and also, frankly, how I live my life. So one of those is decision analysis, which you'll hear about in a moment. Uh, another framework that has been just as important and just as influential for me in venture capital is this notion of telling the whole truth. So this has really been a theme for me. Like In my doctoral dissertation, I was uh, very proud to have found a little bit of negotiation. So my, my dissertation was in the role of, and value of information in negotiation. And there's, when you're collecting information in negotiation, there's a segment where there was, I was able to create a framework where there's no incentive to misrepresent your beliefs. So I was kind of proud of that and then even more fortunate to be able to write the book with Ron, The Ethics for the Real World for Harvard Business School. And when the, the, what Ron mentioned in terms of that introduction, so when I first got into venture capital, uh, there was this gentleman that was been in venture for about 30 years and he was kind of kept me and took me under his wing and he, he had about 30 years of experience. And after we'd done a number of deals together, he started introducing me as, here's my colleague Clint, he's a venture capitalist that tells the truth. And after doing this a number of times, I finally took him aside, like, David, what does this say about the industry that that's a remarkable thing for you to mention about me when you introduce me? And so, so you'll see those two th themes throughout this talk. So one is the role of the decision analysis framework and also the role of truth, if you will, and truth in terms of not only what you tell other people, but the stories that you tell yourself. So when I first started in venture about nine years ago, I went to a number of folks that I knew who had funded my prior companies. And these are, and also folks that I knew in venture capital with a question, well, how do you do it? So I'm kind of new to the industry. You know, how do you become a good venture capitalist? And almost everybody told me some version of, you gotta look the entrepreneur in the eye, you gotta get a feel for the market. Some people have the magic, some people don't. I'm like, really? That, that's all you got for me? And I was like, well, you know, I'm kind of thinking about using some data, building a few models. There's this thing called decision analysis that I think might be really helpful in the industry. And they all said, clank, 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 you just don't get it. We have a few analysts that run a few numbers and that sort of thing, but nobody really pays any attention to them. You got to find the patterns. It's all about pattern matching. All right, well, so I've looked for patterns in venture, and it turns out there's a lot of them. So in venture capital, pattern matching often means, and this is a caricature, but it means, uh, what does a good entrepreneur look like? Well, it's a white guy who's dropped out of the computer science department at Stanford or Harvard. That's the, pot, that's the model of a good entrepreneur. And you know, on the one hand, it's a little bit of a joke, but on the other hand, 2% of venture capital dollars in the US last year went to women-only teams. 79% went to male-only teams. All right, so there's some of this pattern matching that's just off from my point of view. Now, to, to give VCs a little bit of credit, venture capital is a really hard business on the decision-making side. And here are a few of the challenges from my point of view. The first, first one is uncertainty. Well, you know, we know what to do with uncertainty. But venture capital is extreme in the world of uncertainty. Just to give you a sense of how extreme, there's a group called Cambridge Associates that tracks all the venture capital investments. And they map that each year identify the top 100 investments in venture capital out of 4,000 deals that are done. Those 100 investments essentially are where 100% of the profits in the industry are. So now if you step back and think about it, if a venture capitalist makes a decision, makes an investment, they have a 2.5% chance of that being an interesting outcome. Now you would think with a 97.5% failure rate, there would be some humility in this industry. <laughs> Strangely, that's not the case. So if you talk to some folks about VCs, about, okay, their bad decision, well, what happened? And I've had a chance to do this. Inevitably, you get some version of the story of, I was just too early. I read between the lines. I'm just so far-sighted in my view of how technology will impact society that I have to hold myself back to keep up with you know, the rest of society. There's no learning in that. But this is the story that people tell themselves. It's like, how in the world can you get away with telling yourself that story? Well, in the world of venture capital, between the time you make your investment, 
and you have an IPO, it's now nine years. And if you're a typical VC, you're making one to two bets a year. In other words, it's an incredibly small number of data points and huge time frames between when you make the decision and you see the outcome. Lots of room for your ego to show up and you can tell yourself whatever story you like. Now, by the way, you know, when you're in an environment with lots of uncertainty and lots of ego, these biases essentially don't change very fast. They get locked in. Fortunately, there are some things you can do about this. And at Ulu Ventures, we focus a lot on all three of these areas. So for uncertainty, so we've got decision analysis, which you're all talking about you know, in this class. And in a lot of ways, we look at decision analysis as a way to confront our ignorance with respect and dignity. So think about that challenge for a moment. So of the, of the startup companies that get venture funding, it's already a tiny minority that get venture funding, 2.5% of them are going to be interesting outcomes. That's a really humbling place to be. By the way, I was an entrepreneur for a number of years, and I sort of, I sort of experienced the 97.5%. So now the question is, okay, when you're in this realm of such extreme uncertainty, how do I have interactions? And by the way, Somak, who's going to be talking on Thursday as part of Ulu Ventures, how do we have these interactions in a way that respects the entrepreneurs, what they're trying to do in the face of all this uncertainty? And, and from our point of view, decision analysis is a way to bring dignity and respect into all this. So it's not about, by the way, there's some VCs, they want to hear the story, I'm going to have a million dollars in revenue at the end of year one and a hundred million dollars in revenue at the end of year three. And I can guarantee that. It's like, nobody can guarantee that in this business. And we're not asking our entrepreneurs to say those kinds of things that they don't believe in order to get our money. Now on the ego side, I think the best way to confront that in our world is simply learning. So it's, what do I mean by learning? It's like, okay, well, I've got all this uncertainty. How do I have a conversation with the entrepreneurs and the other folks that are experts in this in such a way that I, from my point of view, come up with a good risk return view of the investment? And so there's a lot of like the, how Ron does his Socratic dialogue. It's a lot like what it looks like with my conversations with entrepreneurs. So there's certainly the pitch, the entrepreneur saying, here's my story and whatnot. But a lot of this is really back and forth. It's a mutual exploration of where the risk and where the value is. Biases are a really hard nut to crack in this industry. And so hard nut, not just because of these things, but actually the, so, the, the standard social feedback loops in venture are all broken. In most worlds, if you're a jerk, people tend not to want to work with you. <laughs> in venture, you can be a jerk, and people still come to you all the time wanting your money. And so, and, and by the way, you know, CEOs of big companies face this, so, so venture is not alone in having broken social feedback, but I think, I think venture is unique in the fact that they've got broken social feedback on top of all these other challenges. And from my point of view, the best way to confront that is just diverse points of view. So, so some of the diversity in uh, Ulu Ventures, for example, my partner is my wife, and she has a different point of view, and let's just say I respect that. <laughs> And she's also Puerto Rican, and she was four degrees from Stanford, early employee at Google, ran the legal department on the board of trustees at Stanford. So she's got you know, an incredible list of credentials. And she shows up in this world not with a decision analytic point of view per se, although she appreciates that, but it's really more, more one of culture and teams and how do you treat people and empathy with your customer and that sort of thing. So a very different point of view. And Soma, who recently joined us, also shows up with a very different point of view. So he shows up with a point of view on, well, what's your meaningful purpose? And what are the values and the things that you most care about if you're an entrepreneur or you're a VC, and how does that enter in this mix? And from my point of view, that's the best way to confront biases, is to bring in a diverse set of points of view. All right, so that's a little bit of context in terms of, I call it, the decision-making struggles in venture. Now, before I talk about individual investment decisions, I want to give you a little bit of a picture of essentially the decisions that we face in this industry. Those are the decision hierarchy, which you may have seen here in class. And before we get to actually making investment decisions, which are sort of what you see from venture capital in a public sense, tip of the iceberg or bottom of the decision hierarchy, first have to figure out your strategy, which is, okay, out of the 500 venture capital, venture capital firms in the US, how are we going to show up in a way that's interesting? And so here you can see Ulu Ventures. So we're seed stage, meaning we're investing very early on. 
uh, enterprise IT as opposed to consumer. Fund size, we're a $60 million fund. It's interesting, it's kind of a decision. It's kind of how lucky do you get on fundraising? We have to do our own fundraising. And you can see some of our other kind of how we think about our strategy. Now, once we've got our strategy, the question is how do you put together a portfolio, a group of investments that's going to deliver on that strategy? And I'm going to talk about that in the second half of my talk. And I'm going to start here with what's most visible, which is how do you decide whether to invest in a startup company or not? So let's talk about investment decisions. So here's the ULU investment process. So the very first step when we see an entrepreneur, and by the way, we have about 2,000 inbound slash outbound um, interactions with entrepreneurs. So there's 2,000 startups that we touch in one way or another. A lot of these can be for just 30 seconds. Some of them can be for months. And we're sorting qualitatively. Is this company a fit for our strategy? So early stage, enterprise IT, Silicon Valley based. Do we like the team? Is it a big market? And we sort qualitatively sort out most of the companies here. In step two, we do what we call creating a market map. So we literally get in a room with the entrepreneurs at a whiteboard and build a picture of the market opportunity. So this is their target customer, the business model, adjacent markets, competition, how it changes over time. And what we're trying to get there is, okay, what makes you excited about this market? What makes you worried about this market? So get those on the table. In steps three and four, we quantify everything. So you, you guys know how all that works on the quantification side, but essentially if somebody says this is a billion dollar market opportunity in five years, our question is, well, by that do you mean somewhere between 900 million and 1.1 billion? Or do you mean somewhere between zero and 10 billion? Because all the action is in the range. And so that's our goal up front is to get essentially bound all of these assessments. And then we can do a sensitivity analysis. And out of the 100 things that you might think about in a venture decision, there's only five or six that matter. And once we can pinpoint those five or six that matter, now we can do a deep dive into those issues and at the end of the day calculate an explicit risk return. So this is our process. By the way, if I just compare this how this compares to most VC processes, it, we're similar on step one and a lot of VCs, I don't know how they get to ultimately making a good decision, but then the magic happens. So step one looks a lot like ours and they'll even have here are the criteria that we're doing to sort. So they look very organized up front and then a bunch of conversations happen and they make a decision. So I'm going to jump into a case study in just a moment, but any questions on the context before I jump into the case study? Yeah? Are you able to actually see what chances there are of the company actually crossing the chasm or not getting the, you know, not getting past it, or how do you actually like calculate those probabilities? So, so I'll get into that with a case study. It turns out that that's a, a quite an involved answer to that. But yeah, but that, that's really the heart of it, which is how do you really understand um, quantify, if you will, the risks in a believable way. All right, so let's talk about a, a case study. We know SoFi, Social Finance, you heard of that company? So it was actually a group of folks out of the Stanford Business School that started this back in 2011. And the team over there, led by Mike Cagney, essentially looked at student loans and they said, this is kind of a strange market. So here you have people coming out of the Stanford Business School in Stanford with less than a 1% default rate, people coming out of the University of Phoenix with a 20% plus default rate, and they're all paying the same interest rates. It's like, how can that be possible? Well, government regulation is the reason that's possible. And so he said, well, the reason everybody's regulated is because they're all banks. So we're gonna show up and give student loans and we're just gonna cherry pick the best customers, the best credit risks, and give them a lower rate loan. And we're only gonna do that for, basically there's 100 schools out there that have a 1% or lower default rate. And we can go do that because we're not a bank. So that was the initial idea. And uh, it came through a group called Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs. So if you haven't heard about this, I know, is anybody here from Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs? I know we got, we got one member, a couple members, great. So it's a group of alumni, just what it sounds like, who wanna be, who are alumni of Stanford and want to be connected into essentially the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so it was, uh, we've, we found SoFi through that group. We met them in September of 2011. And, and this is, what I'm going to show you is the actual analysis we used 
in evaluating SoFi. So I've got permission from Mike, the CEO, or former CEO over there, to use these numbers in a public setting. So in terms of the filtering criteria, Mike was a very compelling CEO. He'd been an executive at Wells Fargo and deeply understood the student loan area. It was a strategic fit, seed stage, enterprise IT. It turns out it's a very much an enterprise company in terms of where you get, get the funding. By the way, if you say, say to a student, how would you like a 4% loan or a 6% loan? Which one do you want? That's, that's not a hard consumer sell. The hard place is, well, how do you go get 4% money? That's, that's, so that's where the enterprise IT thing came in. And then in terms of the market opportunity, you know, student loans is a trillion dollar mess in some ways. So fits our initial assessment. So then our question is, okay, well, what's the chance this company is gonna be able to essentially go through those various phases to get to be a successful company? So we start looking at an early stage success. And by the way, the framework I'm gonna show you comes from a guy, Jeffrey Moore, who wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. So this is back in the 90s, he wrote this. And to this day, I still think it's the best explanation of how a startup needs to change from being an early customer, where essentially you're talking to paying visionary customers who like to have cool technology, all the way to a successful company selling to mass market customers who could care less about the technology, only care about business value. So there's a shift that has to happen as companies grow. So here you can see some of the dimensions upon which we assess risk. And this is just for early stage. So usually early stage is defined as you've got somebody that's paying you money. So you've been able to build your product, you've been able to put together a team, get enough money, and at the end of the day, you're successful because somebody's paid you money for something. Now, a lot of VCs talk about these same dimensions. What's different is we put numbers on all these. Numbers in the sense of what's the chance we think that this company is going to be successful on say like the financial dimension. And by the way, at the time we invested in SoFi, they'd already raised most of the $2 million they were trying to put together for their initial round. So, so we, we were actually gonna top it off. So they, you know, 100%, they've raised the money that they've said they needed. The team was great, hard to imagine a better team. The product was interesting in the sense that they had a little bit of risk in the product, but this was a company that was like right there. They were like, they had a deal with Stanford Business School to offer this to students and so forth. So it was just, missing a bit of execution on the product. So very high chance of early stage success. However, given early stage success, what's the chance now you can cross the chasm? And so the distinction here is you're going from visionary customers to pragmatic customers. So these are folks that they don't care that you're like the cool new social way to get loans. They're just like, give me a better rate and make sure that you know, there's no risk associated somehow with me transferring my loans to you. And so they buy in a very different kind of way. And, and so when we look at the market, we're kind of like, okay, so the Stanford Business School is willing to take a shot on you. Oh, by the way, there are five of you are from the Stanford Business School, so you, know, not, you can understand how that might happen. But what about you know, Harvard Business School or Williams College or these folks that have no connection to you? Are they really going to offer you as a, basically a student loan program to their students? Are they going to endorse you? So that was like, well, you know, probably but 70% chance. So we could easily imagine these other schools saying, nope, sorry, this is too risky for us to be promoting you to our students. And you see uh, various risks on the product and the team and so forth. Now what's interesting about this, these are all individually pretty high chance of overcoming that risk, but you can die on any one of these things. So Williams and a bunch of colleges could say, yeah, we're gonna promote you to, to, to our customers, and guess what, you run out of money, you're dead. Or the team can't get along and the team ends up you know, splitting apart. Oh, well, you're dead. So these are all different ways that you can die and collectively ends up being a surprisingly low chance of crossing the chasm. Once you cross the chasm, you typically do it in a niche. And so the niche might be these top schools with, less than, with students with less than a 1% default rate. But that's actually a smallish market. So now you have to, now the question is, well, how do you get to be a really big mass market player? It's like, well, you're gonna have to figure out what are you gonna do with the other 3,900 schools that are out there? And so, and by the way, at this point, it's a highly regulated environment and you get big enough, it's like, well, is the government gonna come in and say, I know you're not a bank, but you're acting an awful lot like a bank. We're gonna just apply the banking rules to you, which would kill their business model. So we put a relatively high risk on the market and collectively ends up being 26% chance of mass market success. 
And then we've got a way that we think about the mass market share, which is a little too involved for today. Now this is a lot of information, but it can be nicely summarized in a decision tree. So here are all those numbers from before. So 90% chance of early stage success, given early stage success, 45% chance across the chasm and so forth. On the market share, we break it down into, there's another book by Jeffrey Moore called The Gorilla Game, where he talks about how profit pools tend to shake out in different markets, where there's like a market leader and a challenger and so forth. So we've got those distinctions up there. 60% chance of failure. So even if they get you know, a handful of top universities to adopt their program, but they can't go beyond that, at the end of the day, this is effectively a zero for us. So this is pretty good, by the way. 60% chance of failure. A lot of times we're looking at 80% chance, that sort of thing. But you know, this is kind of the dynamic. So that 40% chance of success has to be attractive enough to make up for that 60% chance of failure. So now we're going to talk about, well, how do you calculate the value of success? Well, so this is that market mapping session that I mentioned before. And I won't go into details, but essentially you've got, at the end of the day, this is actually, it's multiple on invested capital I'm looking at. And if we know how much we've invested, we know our ownership at the time of exit, and we know the enterprise exit value, we can calculate what our, essentially our multiple on our investment is. Now it turns out, like ownership is kind of tricky in the sense that it depends not on, only on the valuation in terms we can negotiate in this round, but a whole bunch of future dilution that might happen. So every time you raise another round, you hire more people, there's more dilution there. And interesting, we found entrepreneurs are not very good at assessing dilution. So we've got benchmark data and we just do that all ourselves. Whereas when it comes to the market side, that's really where the entrepreneur is the expert. And so we're relying heavily on the entrepreneur, not only to like jointly we create these distinctions, but to assess them. So once we've done all the assessments, we get our sensitivity analysis. So these are essentially all those bubbles that were in the influence diagram. And you can see here that at the top of the tornado, we have mass market share. So assuming you get to be a mass market player, then the question is, okay, how do you compete with Wells Fargo, Bank of America, all these other folks that are in the student loan business? And if, by the way, you have a hard time competing and you have a 3% market share, our probability weighted multiple on invested capital is less than 10. By the way, 10x is where we want to be. If, on the other hand, you're the market leader and you have a 30% share, this is a fabulous investment for us. So now we're more like in the 50x. By the way, everything else kept at its base value. So this is looking at just the sensitivity around mass market share all by itself. And, and the point of this is not to give you an answer on the decision so much, but to help you understand the key drivers of risk and value. So this is actually, there was you know, a bunch more on here. This is only looking at the top, what does it look like, top dozen, top 15. But you can see, you know, you've got two that really stand out and you kind of get down to here and those top four or five variables it's really about 95% of all the uncertainty in this. So those are the ones that we really want to make sure we understand. So now we can put it all back together. And this is, if you will, the bottom line chart where we bring all of it together. So here we have the risk from before. And we've pulled out a few select numbers from the analysis in order to help tell the story. So in the event you're a market leader, 2% shot of that, this is about 1.6 billion in revenue. It's an enterprise exit value of $9 billion, so this would be a good-sized IPO. Our multiple on invested capital is 492 so if we put $1 in, we're getting $492 back. Sounds great, but we discount that by the chance it's going to happen. So 2% times 492 gives a 10.4x probability weighted multiple on invested capital for that scenario. We do the same thing for each scenario. Add it all up. If this bottom line number is 10x or better, you're in the investable set for us. So let me just pause there for a moment, because this is kind of the, the punchline slide on the investment side. What questions do you have? Yeah? What if that final number comes up as like 9.8 or something? Ah, yeah. So, so, so the, the good question. So, so the goal of this exercise is not to come up with the right answer. The goal is clarity of action. 
right? So this is, this is a way for us to take our gut feelings, put them down in a way that we can test them, and then once we test them, that'll help inform us. So at the end of the day, if it's 9.8, you know, this is not that precise of, a, of an exercise. So, so then it'd be the kind of thing which is, do we believe it? So that's always the question. So, so here's the thing. So at 20x, we're like, you know, there can be a bunch of stuff in here that we're off on and it just doesn't matter because it, so it clears the bar by a lot. If it's 9.8, it's like, hmm, we better really believe everything in here. So now we're back to the tornado and we're saying, okay, let's take those top bars. Like, do we really believe them? Because if we're off, even if we're off on like one of like the high range or the low range, that could actually change a 9.8 to a 9 or an 11 or that sort of thing. So, so it, it's a lot harder for us at the 9.8 in short story. Yeah, Ron. I notice in this case it would be 10.2 if, if there was no uh, getting to the market leader. By 5.2, 2.6, 2.4 added up would give you 10.2. If you've got nothing, assume there's zero probably. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. In other words, uh, th that top one becomes kind of gravy. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, that would be wonderful if it happens, but it's not a bad investment if it didn't happen. Yeah, it's sort of, sort of interesting. I mean, and, and and that plays out here because this is a, was a much better than average set of numbers. Yeah. What's, what's interesting, if you just take away this top yeah. um, scenario like Ron's suggesting, in most cases it takes a good investment and makes it not good. Because like here, if, if it's it, okay though. Right here, so, so let's say this were a 15x. You take away this top scenario and now you're at 5x. So that would be kind of more typical. So, so really, really, so, and by the way, this gets into our filtering. So when we're like, okay, do we go from kind of an initial intro to doing due diligence in a company? One of the things we look for, does that scenario exist? Are the entrepreneurs playing in a big enough market opportunity that we could imagine that? Because if the answer is no, we just don't even go through the analysis. So, well, I, yeah, go ahead. Is, is there a time scale for the stages that is taken into account here? Like when do you determine early stage success and how long before you go past the incubation period to determine the first first um, gate i guess yeah well so i one of the one of the large decisions we've made or one of the large simplifying decisions we've made is that we don't look at timing and and by the way so that this is i think a lot of people in venture and, and most people in investments look a lot at timing and even at this thing called irr in, yeah. which, is a, which is a timing-based notion. And, and our notion on this is like, it's really hard to predict the timing of innovation waves. You know, how quickly are smartphones gonna take off or IoT gonna take off? And, and our notion is, well, IoT is gonna take off and I don't know if it's gonna be two years or 10 years. And so in here, basically what we're saying is, like with SoFi, if this happens in five years, this is spectacular. If it happens in 10 years, it's still good. I mean, if we're, if we're in this market leader scenario, we can hold SoFi for 10, 15 years, and we're still get really great investment returns. And so, so and by the way, this is, this is because we're doing early stage with really huge potential outcomes. We think that allows us to not break our brains, if you will, on timing, and still have a robust system. But by the way, there's, there's another element to your, uh, to your question, which I think is interesting, which is, when do we start learning from this? So, so there are some things that we can see. So if they never get out of the gate and never have any customers, you can see this very easily. And when that happens, our notion is, well, did we miss something? So did we just get unlucky? By the way, so if we make 10 SoFi investments, we'd expect one in 10 of them just to never even make it out of the gate. So it could just be, it's like, oh, well, you know, that was just the one in 10. Or if there's something in here, let's say that the team melts down. And by the way, we gave the team really high marks here in the early stage. It's like, boy, we missed something. And so one of the things that we've built here is a learning system. So we can look at what's actually happened versus what we predicted is gonna happen along the way. And that allows us to, if you will, update our assessments and you know, hopefully get smarter as we go. Yeah, Ken. Would you entertain circumstances where the uh, the structure of your funding uh, 
both altered the probabilities and uh, and capped or reduced the the right hand column there. So and, so like so what would be an example that you're thinking um, about? People are are exploring funding arrangements that you don't lock in, but come closer to delivering 3x, 5x, something like that. But they significantly change the probability bands around uh, what you might get, um, which gives you a trade-off because you've got a you've got a number there at the end with, with you know without a probability distribution around it. And imagine that we could, to yeah. some reasonable degree, a priori, think about sort of pulling in the tails of that distribution. Yeah. But so so there, there's definitely you know, investors out there that try to lock in profits, if you will. By the way, one way you can, if a company goes public, you can lock in profits by essentially shorting the company. And essentially what that does is to say, well, if the company's stock goes down, I get paid. But you essentially lop off the tops of, of the bands if you do. And for us, we're, we're really outlier driven in the sense of, you know, somebody being in this category makes our entire fund. So in our fund, we're going to have 60 investments. If we get one that's here, everybody's happy. We're happy. Our investors are happy, that sort of thing. So, so we're, we're reluctant to do anything that reduces the top side possibilities, even if it can you know, basically shore up the bottom, if you will. Yeah? Um, to what extent do you concentrate investments in particular areas in order to c increase the odds of getting that market leader? You know, do you do multiple bets in a particular area or... Are you kind of across, uh, what would you do competitive versus SoFi, for example? You know, um, so we don't have an explicit policy not to do that. I say this is more of a relationship thing. So if we were to run across a competitor to SoFi, what we would do is we would actually probably go to SoFi and say, hey, look, we're thinking of investing in this company over here. Would you have a problem with it? And especially once companies kind of get a little bit of success under the belts, we found them to be pretty lenient on that. And by the way, we're a small investor. So we put like 500,000 would be a very typical seed stage investment. By the way, SoFi has raised $2 billion in capital. So anything that Ulu is gonna do is, you know, barely noticeable for SoFi. And, but you know, but if, but if it was like early on and Mike was like, boy, you know, if you invest in, you know, LendUp or something like Lending Club, I'd be, that'd be really concerning to me, then we wouldn't do it. I guess I'd ask more if you, if you picked an area of real interest, you know, let's say IoT, yep. how many bets would you feel that you needed to place in that in order to try to get to, you know, how, how, how do you think about that? Well, so, so, the, so the portfolio construction yeah. is actually, it's a, it's a somewhat involved topic. I'm going to talk okay. about that in a little more in depth, but, okay. but, th but this is, there's, there's a lot to answering that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe I missed this at the beginning, but how do you decide ownership percentage? or ownership stake, because this seems to just indicate more of a should we invest or not, rather than how much, what percentage should we take? Yeah, so, so there's a lot of ways that we're different than typical VC out there. So a lot of VCs are like, I have to have 10% ownership or 20% ownership, and they actually build their whole story for their investors around ownership. And you're right, there's no ownership in this. And from our point of view, you know, 1% of Google works just fine. <laughs> so, so, so ownership is not really our issue. Our issue is probability weighted multiple. And by the way, it's built into here. So if let's like let's say SoFi was going to double the price at which we paid, then essentially all of these multiples get cut in half. So that's where, that's where it shows. So it's embedded in here. And um, but at the end of the day, whether we're buying one percent of a company or ten percent of a company, it, it really just doesn't make any. Frankly, it really doesn't make any difference to us so long as we're getting a good multiple. And by the way, there, there's a, I'll talk about this in a little bit in terms of follow-ons. So a lot of VCs say it's really important to follow on in your winners to maintain your ownership percentage. And we'd actually argue that that's a fool's errand. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned learning a little bit. I think that's very interesting. Since you have, you have a 60-company you know, portfolio, has your... Has your learning indicated that you're more or less biased or unbiased, or you know, like have, yeah, can you talk about that? Like, have you learned a lot, or is, is your original process, you know, you think you're pretty made pretty good assumptions going in? Well, you know, so 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 I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you asked that. So early on, mm -hmm. by the way, you know, the folks that are the experts in the industry said this is a waste of time. Do it from your gut. So we actually did some that are kind of gut based. 
And by the way, you know, it's not just flipping a coin. Right? So you call customers and do reference checking and look at their technologies. There's a big long list of things that you do on your due diligence side. And we had 20 investments we made. Our initial portfolio was 64 companies. 20 investments we made without this process. And some of those because it was, you know, so obvious it was a great it was a great opportunity that we didn't have to go through all this work of this process. And 44 where we did the process. 10 of the 20 companies where we didn't use the process are out of business. So a 50% failure rate. Five out of the 44 where we did use the process are out of business. So you know, basically a 5% failure rate versus a 50% failure rate. So one thing that this process at least does for us is it systematically helps us look at all the risk factors and essentially not fall in love with companies. So that's one of the problems. Like you get so excited about an entrepreneur or an area or a, that an area that they're in, you're investing in that you, this confirmation bias shows up, right? So you're doing all this diligence, but you're looking hard for the stuff that confirms what you already want to do and things that don't confirm it, you have a tendency to ignore. So that's like one on this. So, so I'd say, you know, so our initial data ad hoc as it might be suggests that this is a much better way for us to make decisions. And then if you say, well, what about those 44 companies we invested in? So how did they play out relative to these probabilities? And the short story is they're not failing nearly as fast as we thought. You know, it's a good problem if you're going to have a problem on your assessments. You know, so part of our story to ourselves is it's been a, it's been a real bull market for the last eight or nine years. Since 2008, it's been a great time to be in the venture business. There's just so much money that's piling in. You've probably heard of the SoftBank fund. They've got, you know, $91 billion that they're investing in late stage. So basically, there's all this money to prop up bad companies. So, so, there, so I, we think that there are a bunch of companies in our portfolio that at the end of the day are going to essentially fail, but they just haven't done it yet because there's so much money sloshing around out there and they're good enough to go get that. But if you look at, by the way, just SoFi. So SoFi right now is essentially at, at this level. So last year they did about, these are public numbers, so you can, you can find them in the Wall Street Journal. But last year, they did about $500 million in revenue. And if I look at how SoFi did relative to that, so in some ways, you know, that's a surprise. It's already in the kind of the, this top 5% category. And I'm, we're still pretty bullish. I think at the end of the day, it'll be in this top category. What's interesting is I underestimated dilution. So we're $500 million in revenue. So you'd think, oh, we're, we're up 160x on that. We're up 83x on that investment. Well, you know, that's awesome, right? So that alone makes our portfolio but it's half of what we had estimated back here. And one of the reasons is because Mike, when he went through this, said lots of companies die because they're undercapitalized. Overcapitalization, you know, okay, I get diluted a little bit more, but I have lots more shots at success. So, so he's raised over $2 billion. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's been successful in the sense that he has not been, if you will, stingy with how he uses his equity to pull in capital. And actually, here's a few of those numbers. So, what happened? We invested, obviously. They've raised a ton of money. What's interesting, not, not only their revenue, but they're hugely profitable. And this is an amazing organization in terms of the business model. And they're doing $3 billion in refinancings every quarter. Now, the other thing that I missed in here, by the way, was, well, I didn't really miss it. We just didn't model it. But from the very beginning, Mike was like, hey, I've come from Wells Fargo. There's two places where banks make money, high net worth individuals and small businesses. We're going to go after student loans as a way to get to the future high net worth individuals and future small business owners out there. So that's ultimately where the big money is. All right, let me switch gears here and talk a little bit about portfolio construction. So that's the individual investment decision. But there is, in some ways, I'd say it's mixed out there in venture. Some people do a high quality job. Some people do a lousy quality job. And, you know, Nobody quite does it in this way. Portfolio construction is actually, in some ways, it's even worse in venture than the individual investment decisions. So portfolio construction, that's this piece in here. So by portfolio construction, how many investments are you going to have in your portfolio? How much do you have in reserve? So how much do you invest up front versus hold money for follow-on investments in the same company? By the way, the industry average is for every $1 you put up front, you hold $3 in, in reserve for a future. And then what's the mix? So this is the how many companies and what areas and that sort of thing. So back to our notion of ego. The standard approach out there, and this is, you hear this a lot when 
VCs are raising money for themselves is invest in me because I can pick winners. You know, look at my past. You know, I was an early employee at Facebook or I used to work at Sequoia. I've got this great track record of picking winners. Because I can pick winners, I'm going to have this concentrated portfolio of 10 to 20 companies. By the way, I can make winners, not just pick winners. So these, I'm going to be limited by, I have to be on the board because I'm going to really help out. And when those winners emerge, I'm going to have a big pool here to double down on those winners. Sounds pretty good, right? I mean, like a lot of confidence. Yeah, how you get, do you know what's going on? Well, we would say that all three of these things are a fool's errand. First, we'd say no one picks winners in this industry. Not John Doerr, not Mike Moritz, not Doug Leone, any of the famous names, if you actually look at their track record. Okay, John Doerr. So he did Google, he did Amazon, you know, amazing stuff, right? Okay, now he's, got, he's also got 30 investments in the clean tech world that have all gone to zip. All right, so, if, so John Doerr's, his portfolio looks a lot like kind of, actually, it's about twice as good as industry average. But still, you know, a lot more failures than success. And by the way, if you can't pick winners, okay, now you're faced with, you know, this two and a half percent number or some really low uncertainty numbers, what does that imply about your portfolio? We'd argue you have to have a large portfolio. And oh, by the way, the reason you have a large portfolio is because you have a couple of outlier successes that make everything. The only way to get the outlier success is to put your money up front when you can buy a lot of the ownership. If you're doubling down on winners, conceptually you're putting money into late stage venture with late stage venture returns. So I'm going to look at this from a couple of, uh, look at some data in the industry. So we like data. This is data that comes from essentially Burgess, which is an accounting system for private equity and venture capital. So the nice thing about this, it's not like biased in terms of who's in and who's out. If you use their accounting system, they've collected this data over 40 years. And if you look at early stage venture, the mean of the industry over 40 years, 22%. By the way, best performing asset class by far of any major asset class. The median of the industry, 5.6%. Now this is a little weird actually. This is the only major asset class, so think public equities, real estate, distressed debt, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only major asset class where there's a huge difference between the mean and the median. What do you think? What's going on there? Yeah. Great, but really successful startups that make like uh, way more than expected. Right. Yeah, right. So, so, so there's sort of disproportionate returns to the successes. Matter of fact, if you look at the underlying probability distribution over returns, early stage ventures describe what they call the power law. So it's one of the things, it kind of looks like this, where you have a huge amount of failures, and then you have this very, very long tail, and out on the end of the tail you have Facebook and Google that are returning 1,000 or 10,000 times people's money. And those small number of huge returns pull up the mean, even though the median looks pretty normal. Or it looks a lot worse. So if you look at so what are some of the, the lessons from this? Well, one of the lessons is if you're playing early stage venture, you want to be the mean, you don't want to be the median. So one way to get to be the mean, imagine if you invested in every single venture investment done. You'd have the mean by definition. So if you could do an index fund of venture, early stage venture, that would be an awesome investment product. Well, it turns out that, does, that doesn't work, so I mean, there isn't that, that product. If you make one investment in venture, odds are you're going to be closer to the median. So now, by the way, late stage VC has a little bit of this dynamic, but not nearly as much. But now late stage VC looks about half the returns on the mean side. In other words, if I'm doing follow-on rounds, my follow-on rounds are, have that as a profile. My early stage rounds have this as a profile. So this would argue for put more of your money early stage in a bigger portfolio. That's a, a top-down look. If we do a bottoms-up look, so this is what I mentioned before, the 2.5% of venture deals generate essentially all the profit in the industry. This is Cambridge data. There's a group called Horsley Bridge, which is a fund of funds that invests in a bunch of other venture funds. And if you go to a top quality fund, so a Sequoia, a Greylock, a Benchmark, <coughs> Excel, turns out 60% of their profits come from 4.5% of their capital investments. So round numbers, they're about twice as good as the average VC in terms of their ability to predict outliers. And well, maybe we'll pat, pat ourselves on the back a little bit here and say we've got, you know, we do good on sourcing, we've got our process. So let's say that Ulu has on average a 4.5% chance 
of an outlier every time we write a check. So we're in the same category as the top tier VCs. Now we've got the data we need to answer the question, how big does our portfolio need to be to feel confident we're going to give our investors high quality returns? The blue line here is a top tier VC. The red line is the average VC. And this shows your chance of an outlier. By the way, remember, if you have an outlier, everybody's happy. If you don't have an outlier, you're really going to struggle as a function of your portfolio size. So at 50, we have roughly a 90% chance of an outlier. Now this is kind of a scary number. So when I talk to our, our, our investors about this, you know, essentially what this means is we could do everything right and there's still a 10% chance we're gonna have mediocre results because we just got unlucky. Now, you know, if we can get up here to 70 or 80, you know, we're maybe close to 95%, but you just never get to 100% in this industry. But now compare what we're doing with the typical VC story, which is I'm really good, I can pick winners, so I'm gonna have a concentrated portfolio. So I'm down here at 10 investments, and let's say I'm the average VC. So I've got round numbers, it's a 20% shot at having an outlier in my portfolio. And, and then you say, well, you know, why would anybody do this? And by the way, you talk to most VCs and they're doing this, especially in my world, so the micro VC world. And typically what they'll say is, well, look at my last fund. I had huge returns. It's like, okay, yeah. Did you get lucky or were you good? And how would you know the difference? All right, so by the way, if there are 100 early stage venture funds following this concentrated portfolio, 20 out of those hundreds are gonna look like geniuses because they're gonna have a concentrated portfolio with an outlier that's gonna give them huge returns. So really the, the goal here is not just one fund with great returns, but it's a series of funds with great returns. So if I've got 10 investments, I've got, and by the way, let, let's give these folks the benefit of the doubt. So let's say that they're a top tier VC, they just have a concentrated portfolio. 37% chance of one fund with an outlier. But this is not a one fund business. You do one fund and a couple years later you go raise the next fund and you keep going. The idea that you're gonna have three funds in a row with outliers, 5% shot. So it's just you know, doing the probability math. So at 50, you know, the 90% goes to 73. And so from our goal, I mean, we wanna get it as close to 100 as we can. And the reason we're not doing 100 right now is because there are some qualitative factors. First of all, how about sourcing? And what's your ability to source? And by the way, we source at Stanford. There's fabulous entrepreneurs coming out of the Stanford community. So no problems in terms of sourcing uh, 100 deals. But now in terms of selecting, our selection process is a little expensive. So to run through that whole, it's not, it's not hugely expensive. It takes us a couple of days. But we can only still only do that a limited amount with, uh, Somic's going to automate us. So we can do it all online. So then that'll help us move down this way. And then supporting. So if we've made, even with 50 investments, we've got um, three of us in the firm, how do we support them in a quality way? And there's a bunch of stuff we've done in the sense we say, we're gonna be your best partner from seed to series A. And when Sequoia comes in and leads your series A, we're gonna roll off the board, you're in great hands, call us if you need us. But so our, our notion is we wanna, we wanna show up where we have comparative advantage. So this story, by the way, of a large portfolio, probably 10% of the folks in venture capital believe this and follow it. So 90% are in that category. And by the way, a lot of the folks that we talk to that are potentially investing in us, so endowments and fund to funds and so forth, look at, the, look at us like we have holes in our heads when we say we're gonna have a large portfolio. Now, there's one other point that I'll put on here on the portfolio construction, which is follow-ons. And if only 10% of the VCs out there believe this, we're talking more like 2% of the VCs believe our story on the doubling down. So almost everybody in the industry believes that the key thing to do is double down on your winners. By God, when you've got that Uber in there, you know, you wanna keep that ownership percentage up. And I, we had one fund of funds that came to us and, and they were like, Clint, you clearly don't understand portfolio construction. So we're gonna, we're gonna build your portfolio model for you. I was like, awesome, <laughs> like, show, show me how it's done. And so they got some more information. They came back with their portfolio model. And this is based on their portfolio model. And they said, so this is, you know, you're gonna do your pro rata through the series C. And so you got your $50 million fund. You're gonna put $260,000 in a seed and 
you know, for your very best companies, you want to maintain your ownership percentage. So that means 260,000 in the A and then the B and the C. And they say, well, see with that C, if you look at like where your returns come, that, that $1.3 million is generating a lot of returns. So that's why you should be, you know, doing your pro rata, maintaining your ownership percentage. So no, it's very interesting. So I took that same model and I just shoved all of the money into the seed round across the winners and the losers. So what happens in the seed round then is we end up buying 12.5% of each company as opposed to 3.3%. But then the, the fund of funds like, oh, well, you're going to get diluted because you're not invest following on in your series A, B, and C. So yeah, we are getting diluted. And so here you can see the dilution. And at the end of the day, we end up with twice the ownership by putting it all up front. This is twice the ownership in the best companies, the ones that have survived. And at the end of the day, the fund multiple is like everything being identical, we're just investing the money earlier, is twice as good as it is compared to doing the follow-ons. Now, what's interesting about it, so I, so I, I sent back the, the model to them and I said, so using your model, but just looking at an alternative way to invest the capital, it shows you're gonna be twice as good. And the response was, yeah, we believe in being aggressive up front too. <laughs> like, okay. But yeah, so, so you know, it, it's, it's, this is sort of interesting. This is like so counter to the wisdom of the industry that you know, even when people like literally see it in front of them with their model and their assumptions, it doesn't register. Yeah. Uh, were you doing the same analysis at CSB and CSC when you were testing this model? You mean in terms of uh, whether we invest and whether to invest yeah. or not, or, or probability weighted yeah. multiple? Yeah. yeah, so so it turns out it's a little more complicated than this in the sense that we don't necessarily put all the money at the series seed. So we get to a series A and we do the exact same analysis we did for our initial investments. And so we basically have an opportunity cost notion. So every dollar we're gonna invest has to compete with every other place we could make that investment. And if it turns out that that series A investment is better than 10x, then we're investors. And if it's not better than 10, and by the way, we think about a third of the time when our companies get a follow-on Series A, it'll be in that 10x or better category. So, so I, I just did it like this to sort of like take the extreme, the corner condition, to, to kind of highlight the differences. Yeah. For the support thing on like uh, initial stages, how often do you do you invest in companies that are already VC backed, so you can you know, um, not uh, uh, use so many resources to support the company and have a larger portfolio? So it's, um, I'd say just descriptively, by the way, so, so we're in fund two right now and we've made 27 investments in fund two, 64 in fund one, 27 in fund two. And I am on three boards and about to join two more. And my partner's on three boards. So you add that up, so five, eight. So eight boards out of, call it, we're making a female. So eight boards out of 30, call it. So that means there's 22 companies where we're not on the board. And we're definitely relying on other people to our co-investors to be essentially the governance and watch out for our interests and be helpful and so forth. And, and, and seed stage actually is really nicely constructed for that in the sense that most of these seed investment, seed rounds are like a million to $2 million. And there's probably two or three or sometimes even four venture firms like us that are writing $500,000 checks in that. So, you know, it, it, and because this is a, I mean, there's a, a community here, you know, so I'm on your board, or one of, I, so I'm on a board where you've made an investment, you're on a board where I've made an investment, we trust each other, and so it works out very well in terms of economies of scale, if you will. And, and what's interesting is it does not work that way at all at the Series A. So at the Series A, now where the, the big guys come in, they want 100% of that for themselves. So it's very rare to see Sequoia and Greylock both in a deal because they both have billions of dollars to invest. And is by the way, and they all know that the big money's in the beginning. So they want to put all their money in the beginning. So they've got a very different model on that stuff. But short story is, yeah, we are, we're, we're looking to, you know, collaborate with others to, on the support side. Yeah. So what are the downsides to making a large number of small investments early on? is that there's so much more of a upfront cost, for, there, there's upfront cost for each investment that you, that you make. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how you do, you do like lawyer's fees and whatever else, do you encapsulate that in your model or uh, how, I mean, it seems like then you'd need a larger team 
to go and make so many small investments? How does that work? Well, so, so it's certainly true that you know, e each investment has expenses associated with it, and mostly on the time side. And, and I'd say, you know, by the way, we, we struggle with that sometimes internally. So my, my partner, Miriam, really likes to build relationships with folks and get deeply involved in that sort of thing. And, and so she sort of feels the pinch on this uh, sometimes more than I do. So I, I was a consultant in my prior life. So I like to kind of like do the quick strike, go in and help you figure out your pricing. And now I am out and you have to do the hard work. <laughs> so, um, but I'd say, you know, doing follow-ons is also a lot of work. So it's not like it's, because uh, like when we do follow-ons, it's, it's not as much work because we have a framework already and so we can update the framework. Um, so I, I mean, so I, so I asked your question again, maybe a little, so it seems like you're getting at a slightly different issue. Well, yeah, because I just think, you know, why not take what you're doing to more of a logical extreme and just say, uh, well, we're going to invest $100 in every early stage company. Yeah. Uh, so. So, you know, and by the way, that would be a really smart strategy if you could have access. All right, so, so the problem is, by the way, so, so this is a world where we're batting 4.5%. And so if we start lowering our standard, so we're starting to invest in companies that have a 1% chance of an outlier success, we need a much bigger portfolio. So it's kind of a balance between sort of keeping the, the risk return high and then enough volume. And, and you know, so if, if I could figure out a way to put $100 in every company that's gotten a venture investment from a reputable venture firm, like I said, I think that would be an awesome product. And it's like, that would be a really, and there's a group called Correlation Ventures, by the way, that's trying to do this in the marketplace. And their biggest challenge is essentially access. So on the very best deals, like on our very best deals, it's actually competitive. So a company might be raising a million dollars and there's $5 million that wants to come in. And so one of our challenges is we have to essentially you know, tell the entrepreneur a story why it's valuable to have Ulu there as opposed to these other three you know, micro VC firms that would rather have our spot. So, so there, there's, there's some, actually those are the balances that lead us to where we are. All right, so what's next for us? So from our point of view, we kind of feel like the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. You know, it's a pretty good place to be, but you know, I'm still operating with one eye, if you will. There's a whole lot that we think we can do next to improve what we're doing. So one of the things that we're doing is we're spending some time on how do we automate some of this? So right now, this is performance art. So I get up in front of the whiteboard and I do my thing, or Somic does his thing in front of the whiteboard, but that's a very limited resource. And the question is, can we take this and essentially technologize it. So we've got this benchmark data, there's a set of patterns that we find out there. Is there a way, and you know, the extreme would be, imagine self-service venture capital. So if we've really figured all this stuff out, make it available to folks online and say, if you want money from, from Ulu, so fill out the form. And oh, by the way, when you fill out the form, there's gotta be validation for it. So if you say you've got a customer, that's great, upload the customer contract. Right, so, so there's proof points behind all this stuff. And I mean, but to me, that's a pretty exciting place to go in the sense of like right now, it's, it's a relatively re restrictive set of folks that we can interact with. Because we only have so much time and so forth. And you know, we have 2,000 potential entrepreneurs we could talk to each year, and we have 200 first meetings. But in those 1,800 entrepreneurs I'm not talking to, I'm sure there's fabulous opportunities, and we just don't have the resources to evaluate them. So if we could make this self-service and out of those 1,800, the 10 that are really interested could sort of rise to the surface, I think that'd be a very exciting place to be. And the other thing we're working on is Somix has us working on, if you will, our meaningful purpose. So think about you know, entrepreneurs, one of the exciting things about being in this industry is entrepreneurs come to us with a huge amount of purpose. And we're really attracted to this. By the way, this is my values map that Somix did with me. And you're like, what really drives me? And so we've got, from an emotional energy point of view, it's leading by example on values. So like Rhonda mentioned that uh, I had that company that wasn't going well, I had raised some angel funding, and I returned all the money. And for me, that was really important because you know, I, I had essentially an agreement in my mind with the investors 
and then the world changed on me and I couldn't, I couldn't live up to my side of the bargain. And so I wanted to make that whole. And I've got a few other places where that to me has really been sort of um, signature events in my life, if you will. Um, unstoppable energy, so what gives you energy? In my mind, this is really possibilities. So in that sense, venture capital is a spectacular business for me. It's like I'm always looking at like the next possibility and I get a lot of energy from this. By the way, this made me a lousy entrepreneur. <laughs> so, so I spent 15 years before I figured this out. And, and it turns out there's this early part of entrepreneurship that I just love. It's the conceptualization of you know, what's the problem that customers have and are they willing to pay for it? And how do I get product market fit and convince those first couple of customers to buy my product? And that was just super fun. And then you got to this point, and I, got, I had four companies I got to this point was where the word repeatable would show up. And it turns out I'm bad at repeatable. <laughs> And so I was always kind of strange. How can I always get these companies up to a million or a few million dollars in revenue and then nothing happens? Like I said, you know, finally got figured it out. And then from an intellectual point of view, you know, what really drives me right now is decision analysis and venture. So this was sort of, I would call it a hypothesis nine years ago. And I'm fortunate to have had enough success in this to feel like I've now got a platform for doing more. So enough success, I mean, when I was first doing um, actually investing, we were just doing angel investing. So it was out of our own pocketbooks. And now we've got we're a, few, a legit VC. So we've got outside investors, we've got you know, real capital, and we've also got a group of folks that are forming around this, both VCs and other folks in the industry that are essentially intrigued with this notion of decision analysis and venture. And so now I've got a, a set of colleagues, if you will, to play this off. So by the way, so GV, which is Google Ventures venture team, is one of those folks that is kind of a thought partner in all this, Correlation Ventures, and a few other folks. So, so it's starting to become more like data in venture, and what are the implications for decision making? You know, you know knock on wood, this will become a wave. At the moment, it's a little bitty thing, but hopefully this is, by the way, if I were to step back for a second and say, you know, and I, I half believe this, half want this. Say, so where is venture going? So think 10, 20 years from now. Well, if you look at, essentially where public equities were 20 years ago, it was a bunch of smart guys in the back room making decisions. It looked just like venture does today. And in public equities, you can't find anybody doing public equity investing like that anymore. Because it turns out data and models are such a better way to do this, it's completely dominated the field of public equity investing. And I'd argue that venture capital will, could follow the same route. Where, you know, the thing about data and logic and models it's like, it doesn't take that much in terms of wherewithal to be able to use those to your advantage. So it's not like you need like this magic crystal ball in order to figure things out. It's not like magic and maybe you have it and maybe you don't. You know, if you're smart and hardworking and have some insights, you know, you can do some credible stuff in this industry. All right, there you have it. What, question, what questions do you have, Wave? A few, a few minutes left, yeah. About some of your failures, um, is this crossing like the one to ten million annual revenue chasm, or could you just speak to a little bit more about uh, those earlier? <laughs> yeah, well, so, you know, so, so I'd say there, are, so, like, a couple of different categories of failure. So, I did one company, Outcome Software, which was um, essentially we're going after risky recurrent decisions in big enterprises. So risky in that they screwed it up. Recurrent in that we could build a model and structure to sort of help them on a consistent basis. So like one of our customers was Eli Lilly, and the question is, well, which products do you launch in which countries? US, Europe, Japan, it's easy. By the way, they, when they have product, I mean, they literally have a portfolio of like thousands of SKUs. It's easy, huge markets, you sell everything. What about Peru or Czechoslovakia? And so we had this system, and we were the very first internet-based system at Eli Lilly or intranet-based system. And we would pull data out of their SAP system on like cost data, and then we'd have a market manager, say in Peru, making estimates on sales and volume. And we'd combine all this together. And what used to take uh, six to eight weeks would literally take 30 minutes. However long it would take you to type in your sales and volume estimate, you could immediately get you know, the full analysis that we showed here, complete with sensitivity analysis and whatnot. So that was Hugely successful, we worked for a bunch of big banks. This would have been 2007. So we were, uh, no, no, sorry. This was 1997 when we started this. And so by 2000, we were geniuses. And in 2001, we weren't very smart anymore. 
And you know, if I look back at it, it's like, so that had, that had the fundamental flaw of we had to get two yeses inside each enterprise. So typically the finance department would own the analysis, so they would have to say yes. But then there'd be a business unit manager that was making the decision, if you will, with finance approval to launch a product. And so we have to get both groups to say yes. And it turns out if you're selling into an enterprise, to get two yeses from two different silos is a nightmare. And if you look at actually the big successes in enterprise, they're almost always, we're selling to the VP of HR or the VP of manufacturing or the VP of finance. We're not selling to multiple of them. So that was, I call it a, a strategic, I mean, it was both unlucky in terms of timing, but it was a strategic mistake as well. Yeah. And um, well, so there, there was a bunch of, so I'd say our, our most successful company that had the most promise where I just got tired of it was a group called Decision Quality International. So we were selling training materials to big enterprises. And we were, it was how to make and cause high quality decisions. And it turns out if you go in there and to enterprise and say, I'm gonna teach you how to make better decisions. It's like, most people are like, well, I don't need help making better, how do you think I got to be an executive? Yeah. <laughs> right? But I don't need that help. But then we said, well, and cause. Well, how about your colleagues? Tell me about the decisions they make. It's like, oh my God, are they as awful? <laughs> so, so that was our hook. And we got some really big organizations to train thousands of people in this. And, and the great thing about training is a fabulous business model. So if you show up in front of a group like this, it's like the economics are okay. But if an organization says, you know what, we want to do this for you know, all 5,000 of our managers, and you're way too expensive, Clint, to show up in person. It's like, okay, so what do you want me to do? So you train the trainer, and then you license them the materials. And uh, so that, that actually had a lot of promise, but I got to the point where you know, if I have to get up in front of a group of executives and do two days of decision training again, just shoot me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was like, you know, after like 40 or 50 times of this, it's like I said, so, so I'm just not good at repeatable. And you know, in some respects, that, so that was the one where, you know, that could have been an interesting business if I just would have had the, would have been wired differently. Yeah. What decision analysis process did you apply to choose enterprise IT as your, you know, category? Yeah, you know, so, so it was a bit of a trial and error. So when we first started doing venture, like nine years ago, well, so, I, my, so my expertise is in the enterprise. So I'd sold enterprise software and that sort of thing. So it was easy to sort of gravitate towards that. And we did a bunch of consumer stuff, and we did a bunch of healthcare stuff. And it turns out that consumer is really hard to model, at least given my level of expertise, because there's this thing called cool that's hard to figure out. So, so some things come along and they're just cool and it's like, boom, you've got this monstrous adoption. But the problem is, I had a hard time picking out cool before it actually popped. By the way, my, my 18 year old daughter can spot cool from a mile away, so if she were part of this firm, we'd be doing consumer stuff. But now if you go in the enterprise, think of the enterprise, better, faster, cheaper. So somebody can basically have an initial pilot customer and, and we think we've got a fighting chance of figuring out whether it's that is something that's representative of the needs of the industry and they can have it sell it through a distribution channel. So we think we've got a fighting chance at figuring it out in a way that in consumer, we just could never figure out how we have sort of any advantage versus the other investors. Because as soon as something explodes in consumer, then it's easy for everybody to see that, oh yeah, I want to be an investor. Yeah. So, so following on that, that point a little bit, do you think there's limitations to types of markets where this might be more difficult? To, to, to apply, so for example, you know, you have to compute all the probabilities for each of them, like, will, it, will it be a niche or not niche, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if it's a, uh, maybe some more blue sky type application or uh, like I said, a consumer application where you just, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, well, so, so I, I guess what I'd say is the more uncertainty there is, the more value there is for this process. So that's what we're looking for. And by the way, there's a lot of uncertainty into, into consumer. So I think consumer is a great candidate for this, but we would just need to make some investments in figuring out the right distinctions and and yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I could, I could probably go do that. I mean, so we've done some consumer. So what does consumer look like? It's, it's driven more by engagement than volume. So if you have a small number of users that are using it like you know an hour a day, it's like oh okay, well now I can imagine a million people using it an hour a day, versus if you had say a thousand people that would use it, you know, a couple of minutes a month. All right, well, I mean, you might have the same total sort of hours in your system, but one has got a really nice foundation and the other one doesn't. And then you say, well, what are the patterns? So, so I mean, so I could imagine doing consumer with this. It's just, I haven't done it yet. 
but yeah, so I say, you know, we're, we're, it, doesn't, it doesn't work well, actually, it doesn't work well when nobody has any expertise, right? So, so if you can't come up with the distinctions that are important to think about, you know, that's the blind leading the blind. What about, is it more applicable to other set like biotech, I would think, they want to do it, stage one, stage two, stage it's just a probability thing. Yeah. Maybe this is even more applicable. To what, well, so it turns out, so actually, so a lot of what we do here was inspired by what's happened in the pharmaceutical industry and actually oil and gas. So in pharmaceutical R&D, decision analysis or some version of it is essentially best practice. And by the way, in my prior life, I spent 15 years helping to make it best practices at a few of these places. Same thing with oil and gas, where you're poking a hole in the ground, you got all this data, and you know, it's like one in 10, one in 20 are interesting. So, so anytime there's lots of uncertainty, this stuff shows up as being very important. Yeah? How does this model affect or influence if it's a marketplace business where you have two-sided um, players in, this, in the ecosystem? So, so I guess, you know, I, I won't pull it up here, but I, I, I just say, so, so, so the, these are things I think the model's very well designed to handle in the sense that you have to get critical mass on both sides of the marketplace in order for it to hit critical. And then the question is, what's, what does critical mass really mean? So if I look at sort of like the early stage success in crossing the chasm, so crossing the chasm with the marketplace is what is critical mass? Because you kind of get to a marketplace where once you hit critical mass, then the thing has a life of its own. And until you get to critical mass, it's pushing a, a rock uphill. Somak? Could you comment a little bit about diversity and some of the metrics that you've seen as a result of all Oh yeah. So. Someone's asking about diversity and what we've seen. So uh, we have diversity as one of our investment theses. So there's a lot of VCs basically, okay, you know, where do you think the opportunity is out there? And so for us, it's big data, it's enterprise cloud, but diversity is actually one of our investment theses. So if you get back to, okay, if 2% of the venture capital dollars are going after women teams, it's kind of like there, there's systematic bias here that actually creates opportunity for us. Because we're, we're going to sort of systematically look at that group and other underrepresented groups. And so we explicitly have, you know, you might go out and you're like, in big data, go find the interesting data companies. We go out and find the interesting diverse companies as well. And at the end of the day, we have um, about a third of our CEOs are women. If you look at like underrepresented minorities, about 9% of our CEOs are, but 9% underrepresented minority CEOs compared to less than 1% in the industry. And in terms of women CEOs, it's, f depending on the numbers you believe, it's like five to 8% women CEOs and we're 30%. And if you actually look at our outcomes, so two of our best outcomes so far are actually two Stanford companies. So Crux, which was done by a, actually one of Ron Howard's PhD students, is a Mex his family immigrated from Mexico. His grandfather was actually an illegal immigrant. His uh, parents, none of them went to college. They had five, uh, brothers and sisters, all went to Harvard undergrad. And then Stan, uh, Tom came to Stanford here, did a PhD. He sold his company to Salesforce for a billion dollars. So if you look at Latino entrepreneurs, that's probably one of the biggest exits in the last five, maybe 10 years. And there's another company, a Blue River. So it was a gentleman from Peru into the GSB, Executive Education Program, sold his company for $300 million to John Deere. So if you look at, I mean, I, I would argue that if you look at our results and like where the big results are coming from, you know, it's a, it's a much more diverse set of entrepreneurs and, and it, you know. But from Stanford. Yeah. But from Stanford, <laughs> right. So, okay, so, so yeah, so, so it's still diversity in a box. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's interesting. So, so my, my partner Miriam is really into diversity and we've got some other folks that like the Kapoor Capital and some other folks out there that are really focused on diversity. And we have sort of an interesting debate in some ways where like Kapoor, do you know you know Kapoor Capital? Yeah. So Mitch Kapoor, inventor of Lotus, and actually original early, found, early investor in Uber has done incredibly well. And his whole notion is, and Frida is, they want to raise the floor. And so a lot of their investments are about raising the floor. And Miriam's point of view is like, you know, that's great. Love to have people out there raising the floor. But we need somebody to raise the ceiling too. <laughs> and that's where she wants to focus on, raising the ceiling. So, I mean, can it, diverse entrepreneurs coming out of Stanford is a great place to, you know, work on the ceiling. All right, so I think we're out of time. Maybe last question. Yeah. So do you think your follow-on investment strategy can do better if you have more volume? 
Yeah, you know, so um, I, I'd say we need a critical mass of volume to get an outlier. But once we've got an outlier, I'd say, um, you know, so, so the volume really drives, do you have an outlier? And if you have an outlier, then the follow-on strategy maximizes the impact of that outlier, or maximizes the returns from that outlier. And do you, do you know what number is it? Like, so you have investment in 50, uh, so what are the thresholds? Like? Well, I mean, so it's, you know, there, there's, there's, not, there's not a number as much as there's a... The ratio between? Between the, uh, oh, you know, so actually, the, so there is this question, it's like, so, when is a follow-on, no way to ask, ask this, when is a follow-on a smart strategy? And it turns out there is a, there is a couple scenarios where a follow-on investing is a smart strategy. So one is, if you're terrible at selecting, right, so, so imagine you do a really lousy job selecting. So you make 50 investments, only one of them is successful. Well, yeah, you're gonna be better off holding on to your money and investing in that one successful investment. So the other time that follow-ons make a lot of sense is if you're lousy at negotiating terms. So let's say you go in and basically you pay a really high price, and in fact that's exactly the same price that the Series A folks invest in. So you've taken all this risk and gotten none of the benefit financially. So basically if you're not very good at seed stage investing, don't do it. <laughs> yeah? Can you want to share the slides? Yeah, I can share the slides. Is, is there a way to share the slides? I'm happy to share it if we have a way to do it. We'll give it to the TS so we put which is, which is any. Thank you. If you're not a student in this class, could you give us your card and we'll email it to you? Yes, okay. Yeah, we do that. Great. All right, well, thank you for coming.